Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day 10 of our 11-day journey through the world of film. I hope you've been enjoying it. I am Mark Fishkin. I am the founder and director of the Mill Valley Film Festival and the California Film Institute. And I'm Zoe Elton, director of programming for Mill Valley Film Festival. As you could have seen just a moment ago on the screen, this is an ensemble spotlight. Uh, it's a very important event for us. Um, film is a collaborative medium, and we have some terrific guests with us tonight for The Lost Daughter. Uh, Mac Maggie Gyllenhaal has been, I can't even get it, get it out. has been acting in films uh, for uh, a while and, and giving us thrill after thrill. Uh, but in this case, she is here as a director. Now, <laughs> and an event like this could not be possible without the support from many, many people, our board of directors, our sponsors, of course, our great membership. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge Ka Kaiser Permanente for their support of this year's festival. And in particular, Patricia Kendall, who has uh, been supporting us for years, not just the festival, but our educational program, which by the way, we are reaching 12,000 kids in 11 days. The miracles of being online, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are benefits to being online. Um, we're just so happy to have Maggie here, and we have an incredible program for you, and I'd like to turn it over now to Zoe Elton. Thank you, Mark. And as many of you will remember, Maggie Gyllenhaal was last here in, I guess, 2018 with the Kindergarten Teacher and uh, the Mind the Gap Award. And at that time, she was talking about this project. Can I just say, I think, Elena Ferrante and Maggie Gyllenhaal is like a match made in heaven. Um, but we would love to invite Maggie up to introduce her film. Maggie, please join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys both so much. Welcome back. What a warm room. <laughs> um, before I introduce my two brilliant cast members who are here, I just want to say one thing. Um, you know, we made the film in a pandemic, probably like some of the other films that have played here. Um, and so, you know, when we were shooting, we were our own little bubble. And then when in, in post-production, it was really just me and my editor alone in a room and then me and my sound designer. And um, we never ever had a screening, which if you make films, you know, is very unusual. Uh, as far as I've heard, you know, usually you would have, you know, many screenings, friends and family or even tested and feel the way your film feels in a room full of people. and. Um, I, the, the first time I ever got to do it was at the Venice Film Festival. And these early screenings, these you know, places where our film has been invited and chosen and curated carefully, and then a group of people come together and see the movie have meant so much to me because they're the first times the movie has played to a group of people. So I'm, I'm really, really, um, I'm really thankful for your invitation and I'm so glad to be showing it here. Uh, and we'll talk about the movie later. It's always weird to talk about it before. But um, if you just wanna have a look at us, uh, here is, um, <laughs> uh, let me introduce the incredible, um, vulnerable, brilliant, intelligent, um, wholly committed Dakota Johnson to the stage. And the equally intelligent, bright, light, huge talent that is Paul Mescal. Do you guys want to say anything or you just want to... Um... Take it away, Paul. You take it away. I don't know what to say. <laughs> is this what you want? 
No, no, we'll talk after. We'll talk okay. after. Do, do you just get down? Wow, you are very sparkly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. We'll be back um, after you see the film. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, oh. One other quick heads up. It's the, the film is not three hours and 26 minutes. No. It's actually about two hours. So, so don't worry, you don't need a bathroom break. Was that a typo? Yeah, that, well, no, it wasn't a typo, it was a verbo. I'm very, verbo. very self-indulgent. I totally <laughs> Oh really no, no, time. not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not a typo, I promise you. Yeah, no. Okay, great, so we'll great. see you afterwards. Thank you. We'll Thank see you so back much. in a little while. A great filmmaker is born. Um, I would like to invite my friend and colleague, Julie Hunsinger, from the Telluride Film Festival uh, to come and present the award for this amazing ensemble. Julie, come on up. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. What do you think? Right? Somebody is a really good filmmaker. And she's such a good filmmaker that I feel like she could have had any award, all the awards from Mill Valley Film Festival. But it is really fitting that this team is getting an ensemble award because for us as we watch the film, there's not a poorly cast person in this film. Everybody did such a beautiful job and by the time you finish, you're in love with all of them. We really are in love with all of them. I'd like to bring up now Maggie Gyllenhaal. Dakota Johnson, and Paul Mescal. Congratulations on making a truly, truly perfect movie. I love you. Maybe give the yes. award to the actors, right? Yeah. Here you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Whew, okay. Oh no, she's missing the head. <laughs> oh dear. Oh. Um, okay, I just want to say a little something on behalf of these amazing actors. I have a kind of ambitious speech here and we're all on London time still, um, so bear with me. Um, okay, I was having lunch with um, Tony Kushner, who I am madly in love with. And um, it was when I was working on something and I was working with a really brutal director as an actress who didn't care about me and who wasn't interested in me. Um, and I was really unhappy. And Tony told me this story um, about Robert Altman that Robert Altman, I guess, told him directly, which is that when they were making Nashville and they were shooting that scene at the end, and you know, like at the Grand Old Opry. Although my dad, who's here. <laughs> um, where did you say they actually were? At the fake Parthenon. Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, you know, but that scene at the end where, where there's like 5,000 extras and you know, it's a massive sequence. And of course they had so much money and there's like a hundred million different camera setups. And um, Ronnie Blakely, who plays the gorgeous um, country Western singer, she was, you know, really into the whole Robert Altman way of working, of, of improvising, and she always had tons of ideas. And according to Altman, um, according to Tony, according to Altman, some of them were good and some of them were not. And Altman was used to kind of fielding them, and, um, but also taking some of them. And so in the beginning of this huge, massive day, she comes to him and says, I, I wrote a scene. And he's like... <laughs> Okay, I have, you know, he's, you can imagine what a crazy day that was. And he's okay, 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 and he's taking care of his actress and he takes the scene that she's written and he sticks it in his back pocket and uh, they're shooting and they're working and it's crazy and like late in the afternoon he spots her standing in the wings of the Grand Old Opry uh, or the fake Parthenon and um, she just looks crestfallen and he realizes he's got the scene in the back, in his back pocket and um, he's like, okay, all right. And he takes the scene out of his back pocket and he reads it. And the scene is her being assassinated 
on stage, which of course is how the film ends. And of course, it's the climax of the movie. Of course, it's bringing the political and the personal together with the music. It, and according to Tony, Altman said, holy shit. Um, and he, he shot it and he used it. And I tell the story to highlight the unbelievable, incredible, emotional intelligence of actors. And to say that um, I hired actors in this movie that I knew that I would want to listen to. And so I was going to just tell you a couple of ideas that came from my actors. Um, well, not even ideas as much as like the deepest kind of understanding. So from my brilliant Dakota, <laughs> uh, I remember we were shooting this, one of my favorite scenes in the movie when um, she's just found, uh, uh, well, no, when, when Olivia has just found her daughter, just found Elena, and she comes over to thank her. And she has this line, which is, um, I like your bathing suit. And I went over to Dakota and I said, so I like your bathing suit means, and she said, oh, I know what it means. It means I love you. And I was like, yes, great. <laughs> um, Paul, I was thinking about this movie, I won't say the movie, I won't say the actors, where a much younger man is put in a situation where, um, in this movie, it's much more kind of black and white, but uh, a much older woman is coming on to him, and he plays the, the scene with a kind of hatred for her. And it makes the entire audience, well, no, maybe not the entire audience, I think people are used to seeing that, but it made me hate him. Um, and you were so clear from the very beginning that you love her. It was the only way to do it. And that was so beautiful. Um, Jesse and the little girls wrote that song, Peel It Like a Snake. Um, Jack uh, Farthing, who plays uh, young lady's husband, came in with the smart and infinitely engaging choice that if he loves his wife, it's a better movie. Peter, my husband, um, my husband plays Professor Hardy. Uh, he found me that Simone Weil quote, whenever one tries to suppress doubt, there is tyranny, which in some ways is the anthem of our movie. Um, Alba Rohrwacher, who plays the, um, the hiker, she had, she's a huge Italian movie star. I mean, it was, I, mean, I, I really, I can't believe she agreed to do this, but she knew that if she didn't come in with her whole vulnerable heart, that there was really no reason to have the sequence in the movie. And instead, the movie doesn't work without it because of her heart. Um, and I am going on a long time, but this is an award for you guys, but it is an honor of you that I'm saying all these things. I just wanted to mention, so Dagmara, this is kind of a long story, I'm trying to decide if I should tell Go it. Go for it, please. <laughs> Dagmara, who plays Callie, I mean, incredible actress, brilliant work. Um, I remember uh, on her first day, uh, an experience I've had many times as an actress where uh, my first AD, who was great, said to me, okay, so we're gonna show you everybody's costumes. And I was like Altman for a minute. And I was like, uh, okay, sure, yeah, great. I was very busy. Sure, bring her out, show, her my, show me her costume. And they like cart out Dag to me in a bathing suit, you know, in front of everybody. And I, when I saw her, I was like, oh, I know how this feels. And I just said, come here. And took her away from everybody and I just was like, you look great. But then Dag took that freedom, which was basically like, I'm not gonna tell you what to wear. And she just kept pushing me and pushing me. You know, sometimes I'd see her in these outfits and think, oh, is that a little too much? And then I, she just pushed Callie into the stratosphere with that freedom, which of course is where she needs to be. Um, Ollie, we were just talking about Ollie, who, Oliver Jackson Cohen, who plays Tony, who barely speaks in the movie and created everything you see, the humanity, the meanness, um, 
without or barely ever opening his mouth. Um, and lastly, my friend and partner, Olivia Coleman, who um, isn't into talking. She just comes free. Every once in a while, she needed a little permission to get back out into the stratosphere, which is where she likes to live. And it was my job to find ways to give that to her. But she, um, yeah, I think she comes free. She showed up free. <laughs> and now um, you guys go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's tough to follow. I think, you know, I, I am not a, I'm not an actress that has received a lot of awards. So I don't, I don't really um, believe in that as like a recognition of what's good or more great or bad or whatever. But there's something about an ensemble award that makes me feel like that is that is cool because there isn't a movie without everyone. And I don't, you know, every film that I've been on, whether there's like, you know, tumultuous relationships or even like a really family like camaraderie, which is what we had on this one, that is the thing that I would love to see celebrated the most because none of our performances, I think, would be what they are without each other. And even, you know, if you get a some kind of, you know, best actor award, you don't get that without the other actors giving you what they give you to work with. So I'm down with an ensemble award. <laughs> and I also think it's, it's just, you know, the person who chooses the people and is, is um, aware of of the human beings that she's putting into her film that came from her heart and Paul I second everything wholeheartedly <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you so, nothing is made in a vacuum and you know as a festival we're not a competitive festival we really love to celebrate great work, and my God, this is such great work. Um, but let's, you know, let's unpack the ensemble thing a little bit. I mean, it, it seems to me that when you have an actor like you, Maggie, who, who has done such extraordinary work and who brings such an acuteness and an intellect to your work, you know what it's like to be on the other side. You know what it's like to create that space for people to do their best work. Um, but what, what can we learn from that? As you know, as, as, as the people on the street, what, what makes a great ensemble? I'm gonna ask you that first. Is that okay? Me. Yeah, to go, to go for it. <laughs> In, uh, but, but being on the receiving end of Maggie, you know, here we are, an, an amazing career in acting, directing her first film. What does she bring to the table that non-acting directors don't? Well, first, uh, Maggie knows, beyond knows, what it feels like to be an actor acting on a set. And that is something that is really uh, nearly impossible to articulate the, what that feels like at any part of the day. You know, you can do, you could be there at five o'clock in the morning and be doing a sex scene, and then by noon you're at some family dinner scene, and it's really, it, it's uh, emotionally taxing and confusing, but also like, you know, that's your job and you do it and you traverse, it's like, you know, emotional gymnastics, and you traverse these peaks and valleys, and it's, um, I think, to be directed by someone who 
is not only holding down the fort, like not only holding this space for um, this thing you're trying to create, and also as an actor, you don't necessarily have full awareness of what the full picture is at all times. Mm -hmm. You don't really know that you're being taken care of or fully protected or seen and like, you know, what you're putting down is being picked up. You don't really, you're not very sure of that. But with her, I think I felt, and I, can I speak for you, Paul? <laughs> Paul and I felt, <laughs> um, I know what it feels like to be this open and maybe you don't know exactly what's happening inside my head, but I've got you. And the places that I want you to go or the places that you want to go are so okay and go there and go there with all your heart and then it's all good. And that is something that I've been like, is that a dream? Is that something that I will ever feel when I'm working? You know, it's not, that's not normal. And it, and she's so smart and so brave and so has the most incredible mind. And it, it I'm going off topic, I think, but look, you're you on are your phone. totally on topic. <laughs> Did Emma boring you? <laughs> no, I'm loving it. No, how often do people actually really get to talk about process? You know, well, that's not a, very that's often. That's another we really weird thing because I don't have a process. I don't right. have like a method of how I go about making everything. I don't know. It depends on who, it depends on the director. Yeah. And I always find that so fascinating. It's like, you know, in a theater company, for instance, you have, you know, like the Royal Shakespeare Theater Company, they've all studied the same thing. They all have a commonality in their backgrounds as actors. Here you are coming together and in that moment, you all have completely different backgrounds. And a director has to bring together that diversity of experience into a, you know, into a cohesive whole. So there's a lot of trust that goes back and forth with that. Um, Paul, so trust. Did Maggie get your trust going out the gate? A hundred percent. Like I feel like um, step eight, like uh, it, it, it's a tri like it's the most amazing experience to get a phone call to say Maggie's going to be directing you in a film. The majority of your scenes are going to be with either um, with Olivia Coleman and you're going to be in scenes with Dakota Johnson. So you kind of go in with this kind of this balance of total fear and like absolute adoration, which is actually a tricky place to begin from. Right. <laughs> so you're kind of like, well, I adore these people and I've watched them for years and years and years. And then you're suddenly Well, maybe in. just like years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies, yeah. Yeah, just years. Be kind. Yeah, um, just years, like to, yeah. Um, and then you're in a scene with them and you're, um, and that's kind of when you, when you hand over, like you have your own kind of inbuilt, I'm able to do this, I'm, your, your self-talk, but you do need, I, I definitely needed the support at that point, and Maggie was there 100%, and not in a kind of like, uh, you're new to this, which I am, but this kind of like, really, you're an artist and you've prepared and you know what mm -hmm. you're doing, and that's actually what I think I needed, and obviously it helps when you're working with yeah. the actors that we were working with, so I think it's, 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 it's all down to Maggie's kind of astute understanding of how actors work, because Maggie's been in my position, she's been there and seen it all, and I think that's something that's like um, incredibly useful. Right. Yeah. I think since she's not here, we should talk about Olivia Coleman for a minute, <laughs> and working with her. So w was she central to actually getting the, the project launched was, I mean, okay. One of the things that I find fascinating about this is when you were here last time, Maggie, um, it was 2018 with the kindergarten teacher and about a couple of days before the festival happened, um, Elena Ferrante wrote an extraordinary piece in The Guardian, The London Guardian, where she basically endowed you 
with the permission not only to work with her book, but to make it your own. And there's something about that that is radical. I mean, just like radically beautiful. Um, well, it's, I think, you know, Elena Ferrante is anonymous. You know, nobody knows who she is. I don't know who she is. I have interacted with her, but mostly, well, entirely through email. Um, and I think her being anonymous, I don't know what her original intention was and why she wanted that, but um, what it did for me was it allowed her to be like whatever I needed her to be at each step, you know, in my fantasy and in my imagination and all of my interactions with her from the moment I asked her for the rights to the book um, all the way through. I mean, when I asked her for the rights to the book, I uh, appealed for the rights. I said I wanted to direct it. I said a little bit about why and what I knew going out. And she responded and said, yes, you can have the rights to the book, but this contract is void unless you direct it. <laughs> Which was like this kind of um, vote of confidence from the cosmos. Uh, and I will say like a feminine vote of confidence. And then this piece you're talking about in The Guardian, as I was adapting, yes, yeah, she wrote this piece, which uh, my, I read to my dad today, which I, I, I hadn't read um, since, probably since it came out, which basically said, it, it said that it was important that my work be good. It was important for women who make art, and that if it was gonna have any chance of being good, it would have to be mine. And so as difficult as it was for her in some ways, she said the primitive part of her mind wanted to keep me within the parameters of her book. The wiser part of her knew that she had to let me free. And she said if I were a man making this, that she would not do that. And in fact, I had dinner with Severio Constanza, who directed, who's Alba's husband, mm. um, the gorgeous Italian hiker, um, who, who directed My Brilliant Friend. And he was like, oh yeah, she co-wrote with me. We, she is, he doesn't know who she is either, but he, she's, he said she was emails every day. And with me, she said, she said, if I were a man, she would not have allowed me that freedom. But because I was a woman and a woman artist, she knew she had to give me that. And there's one more too, but uh, one more interaction I had with her, which was equally as wise and and um, and supportive. Which was that um, you know, then I gave her the script. She hasn't seen the movie yet, but I gave her the script. And um, now that you've all seen the film, the book has there's many many differences. It really became my own. It changed and you know in massive ways. And the adaptation is definitely in dialogue with the book, but very very different. Um, and in, in particular, the last line of the book is basically the opposite of the last line of the movie. The movie ends with her daughter's calling and she says, I'm alive actually. And the book ends not on the beach, but in the apartment where she's stabbed, her daughter's call. They say, oh my God, we haven't heard from you in days. We thought you were dead. Not really dead, but, and she says, um, I'm dead, but I'm fine. And um, I struggled and struggled with that the whole time I was adapting. I had that in the back of my head, trying to understand that. I think I do understand more now. Um, but when she read the adaptation, she said, I see what you did with the end. And she said, I love it. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, I realized they're the same. They're the same. Now I know that they're the same. Really, it's a kind of a death that is giving her a new life, a new birth, a new... Um, but I, I think I, I, I changed it. <laughs> <laughs> and you were allowed to. <laughs> That's pretty great, yeah. yeah. Okay, I have a couple of geeky questions. Please indulge me. About Olivia? Well, actually, oh, God, we didn't talk about Olivia. Well, let's go to that. Okay. Oh, I can oh. talk about Olivia. Okay, go for Olivia. Yes, can I? Well, because, of, because this is so much about the ensemble cast. Yes. Olivia is like the ringleader of ensemble. She is like, let's all be together all the time, which we were. 
all the time, every night, every day, every night. If there was like a minute in the morning before work, it was breakfast all together. We were a true family. My and balcony I, was kind of connected to hers. Yes. Like, yeah. Sorry, that's a null You guys had point. connected yeah, balconies. Yeah, we had a connected balcony. Yeah. Okay, what, cool. what, wait, wait yeah. what did you eat for breakfast? Oh, what did he eat? No, all Pan- of you. Like a stack of pancakes <laughs> covered in like Nutella. It was absolutely bonkers. I'm like, how? The f- how? Like, it's so annoying. Anyway, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, there was something actually genuinely important I was going to say, and now I forgot. About Olivia and the ensemble and everyone being together all the time. No, it's gone. Okay. <laughs> It'll come. Sorry. When it comes back, just please interject. I will. Anyone else Politely. like to say something else about Olivia? Or working with her? Oh, or just that, like, for, that she's in, I imagine, every day, all that you go, you have a boy, that's the point, go. I remember it. (laughs) Um, I think the thing that is really special about this cast is that on screen, I mean, as you guys just watched, it's, there's so much tension and it's really uncomfortable and the relationships, the dynamics between people are, are difficult to watch sometimes. And uh, then also sometimes they're like, you want it to go further and you want more. And then the minute that the camera was not rolling, we were all, like in love with each other. <laughs> yeah, because that is the way, it's like the only way. I'm sure we all have worked with directors who are brutal, who who like want to create tension in order to make drama or something. And it doesn't but work. No, love is the only way. It's, yes. I'm not kidding. Woo. It's so true. So true. And not just in our job, in every job. If you feel loved, if you feel seen, you're willing to take risks, you're willing to think in a new way, you're willing to actually, and that's the thing. I don't really want to see actors, or in my own work as an actor too, I don't want to see actors pretending to learn something on screen. I would way rather see them actually learning something on screen. And so then they have to feel safe and loved and actually cared about. And they don't, actors, we are not stupid. We know if people are faking it. You have to actually love actors. And if you actually love them, then they do amazing things. Yeah, for sure, (laughs) for sure. Well, that actually may kind of lead into one of my geeky questions, which is, I have never seen the poet June Jordan mentioned in a credit role before, especially in a film that's set in Greece and, you know, that kind of thing. But she is a poet who lived in Berkeley. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, And uh, so, you know, she would be known to people here. Um, One of the things that I would know about her is that she talks a lot about truth and really getting to sort of the core of truth by getting deeply into your, you know, your your true self and examining yourself. So, you know, when I sort of apply that to what I've seen on screen, it's like, oh, okay, I can see that, but that's me. Why is June Jordan in the credits? (laughs) Oh, because um, Jessie Buckley, when she's playing Young Leda, is translating a poem by her into Italian. Oh, so I was completely out to lunch. No. How, oh, oh, you mean because you should have been able to understand it no, in no, Italian? No, 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 no. <laughs> it was because my best friend right. is an academic and a poet, and um, I was like, send me some great poetry. I want, if, if she's oh. going to be translating poetry, and she sent me a bunch Got, of things. Right, right, and, right, right, right. And that was what I oh, responded right, to. right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, no, I just thought that, that, you know, there was like some high truth there about June Jordan's work that you're applying to the work. No, but there is, because all of it, I mean, weirdly, even the film that I chose that that, um, Olivia is watching, you know, or that poem, or it's all like, if you're in the current, which is the name of my production company, (laughs) um, everything that comes up, it's like grist for the mill. Yeah. Oh, I like that poem. And oh, I, you know, like I said, I sent Peter off to like do some research about Simone Weil for that speech. And he comes back with like this piece that's that's like exactly the film and everything that everyone's thinking and the things you're eating for breakfast and the songs you're listening to all become a part of the work. Oh, that's so great. That's so great. Well, then I won't be embarrassed about asking my other geeky question, which is about the music. Uh, yes. So, okay, I mean, ding, 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 
ding. Uh, it's like I listened to it and I thought, that is reminiscent of something. Yeah, and what do you think is reminiscent of? I think it's reminiscent of... <laughs> Go for it. It's <laughs> man's yes, world. Yeah, yeah. And ain't nothing without a woman or a girl. Yeah, yeah. And James I Brown. thought only Maggie Gyllenhaal would <laughs> have that audio reference <laughs> to that very, very much, I think, in this film. Okay, but that also happened totally through our unconscious. Like, it oh. was my, my amazing composer who um, I never met until like two days ago in the same room. We worked entirely on Zoom. Um, he was in the UK and I was in New York. And we, I sent him all these references. I wanted the music to sound like um, what we started to call a found album. Anytime it sounded like film score, you know, or like faking like it wasn't there or pulling on your heartstrings, or I really didn't like it. I felt manipulated and I felt like it was cheesy. But I thought if it could be in its own right, like Elevator to the Gallows or, you know, or, or Third Man, you know, where you're like, there's music, that's another character in this movie. Yeah as if you found an album in a garage sale and you put it on and it just happened to be speaking the language of your heart of, you know, this film. Um, and so we were playing music and listening to music and I wanted it to have like that kind of like Italian neo-realist vibe, like, you know, that was kind of my, <laughs> kind of into that. <laughs> and, then, and so uh, we were just listening to music and it turned out that like everything I liked was a waltz. Oh. Right, and is that one waltz? Yeah, ten, 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 ten. Yes, totally waltz. And yeah, yeah. And so, so that's where it started, and then, and then the song came up, and then we kind of realized how close it was to the James Brown. And I was like, I mean, I love that. So it wasn't that we like intellectually chose. Let's make a comment about something. It just came to us, you know, like in our dreams. That's so great. I'm so glad I wasn't so off ball, off, off, off target. <laughs> um, I know that we're coming to the end of our time together. Um, so just to ask you all, um, you shot in Greece, right? So you took this Italian story, you transposed it to a, a bunch of different cultures from the original, which is kind of great, meaning, you know, Olivia and that kind of thing. And um, what was the first day of filming like or how did how did you all arrive in Greece and let's get your arrival stories and then we'll bring this to an end uh-oh <laughs> you're first well um my first day of filming was uh I my seat this uh, the first thing that I had to do was to kiss Dakota had you met at that point we had uh, we probably had met but it was like we were in kind of like quarantine bubbles and I think you'd been filming before me. I think I came out a day or two. I can't even really remember it. It's like after that point, I think I obviously got to know you better. Um, but it was like, that was, that was a, I was nervous. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it was, yeah, I, I was nervous and Dakota was incredible because she could see that I was like petrified and Maggie was incredible. And we just talked for ages, and that was my first ever day filming. Yeah, a I told film. Paul all of my secrets. Yes, she did. I was like, "Oh, this is so uncomfortable. It's our yeah. first day on. It was our first day on set. Yeah, we met like maybe the night or two nights before when everyone was having wine and yeah. like si singing and playing guitar. Yes, um, in the hotel courtyard, and then uh, we. I now know all of out. Dakota's secrets. Yeah. <laughs> But I was like, oh, we're both so uncomfortable. <laughs> la, 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 la. And then I just yeah. told him all these things about yes. my life. <laughs> and now we're really close. Yes. Yeah. And Maggie, what was your first day on set like? Um, my first day uh, was we were filming all of the stuff with uh, Jesse Buckley as a young lady and the little girls. And we had five days to shoot all of it. And so they were really packed days. My incredible DP, um, who had much more experience than I did, really insisted on prep. And so I was really well prepared. 
I remember telling my dad also because I had, you know, we'd worked and thought and talked and and shot listed and shot listed. And she liked take pictures of everything. And I had a whole folder with all of our shots, shot list stuff in it. And I never one time cracked it the whole time we were shooting. Because I was like, now we're going to like play jazz, right? <laughs> and uh, so we get to set the very first day and I'm like very prepared thanks to her. And we start this incredible work with Jesse and I texted Peter, my husband, and I said, this is, this is hard work heaven. <laughs> and what a great way to end this conversation. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I love that. I love that.